I have made band sweeteners, the sweetest compound, and now to come full circle, I will be making a sweetness antagonist, aka a blocker. There exists multiple sweetness antagonists, detailed neatly in this paper I found. However, not all are suitable. If we take a look at the list of molecules, amyloride is a medication to treat high blood pressure. Alexan is toxic and destroys insulin producing cells. Iodoacetamide is a toxic alkylating agent. Chloramphenicol is an antibiotic and these two involve weird sugar chemistry. The other ones are just natural compounds that are too complicated. That leaves me with two options, this urea molecule or the most known sweetness inhibitor, lactazole. Since lactazole is already known, occurs naturally and has kind of an uninteresting structure and synthesis, I decided to go with the lesser known urea molecule. Ironically, it involves the same molecule that I used to make the sweetest compound, lugdenam. So there's definitely some structural relation there. Looking further into it, it seems this blocker is based on the sweetener suasan, modified to instead cause antagonizing effects. The synthesis is relatively achievable, but it starts from this isocyanate molecule, made from the same amine I already have that I used for the lugdenam synthesis. If you've seen it, you know that in the lugdenam synthesis, I converted it to an isothiocyanate, the sulfur analog, with thiophosgene. So to make isocyanates, we generally need the very notorious and toxic phosgene. But some other alternatives exist for the procedure that don't involve phosgene. I'm not gonna work with pure phosgene gas. However, there does exist a solid alternative of phosgene that is a lot easier and safer to handle, called triphosgene. I don't have triphosgene, but its synthesis is relatively simple, and it is a very useful reagent for multiple transformations. It is also very overpriced, so you know what, to save some coin, I will just first start with making the reagent triphosgene. So to get started, I set up a large 3 neck flask with a stir bar, to which I add 500 ml of carbon tetrachloride as a solvent. Into this, I dissolve 90 ml of dimethyl carbonate as a reagent. Most commonly, it is actually used as a solvent, and therefore it's not that expensive. When those are combined, I build the whole setup. On the flask, we have a condenser, which on top is connected to a trap containing sodium carbonate and sodium thiosulfate. Sodium carbonate will react with hydrogen chloride that is produced in the reaction to form CO2 and water, while sodium thiosulfate serves as an indicator for the presence of chlorine in the gas stream. When it reacts with chlorine, it will produce sulfur, which is visible, and I can adjust the addition rate of the chlorine, so that no unreacted chlorine escapes from the reaction mixture. On the right, I have a flask filled with trichloroisocyanuric acid from pool chlorine tablets. When I drip hydrochloric acid onto it, it will produce chlorine gas. For this, I am using FEP tubes, since other tubes will get damaged and leak from the chlorine. To produce chlorine will go through the tube and into the gas washing bottle filled with concentrated sulfuric acid, which will absorb any water that is in the gas stream. It will then exit as dry chlorine gas into the other tube which is connected to a gas in the tube with a glass frit. This will give many small bubbles of chlorine, increasing the overall surface area and increasing the dissolution and reaction speed compared to a normal gas inlet tube. The reaction requires UVA light to proceed at a decent speed, or at all really. So I set up two UVA LED panels and I use a heat gun to just blow air on the flask so that it stays cool. I then just keep bubbling chlorine into the mixture and refill the generator if it runs out. In this reaction, dimethyl carbonate is chlorinated fully into triphosgene by reacting with chlorine under UV irradiation. Carbon tetrachloride is a suitable non-polar solvent for this process, as it is unreactive towards chlorine and dissolves it well. How it proceeds is first through cleavage of chlorine into two chlorine radicals through irradiation from the UVA LED lamps. Chlorine radicals are powerful hydrogen atom abstractors and so will abstract a hydrogen atom from dimethyl carbonate, giving the corresponding carbon radical. This carbon radical will react with the other chlorine radical, giving a monochlorinated product. This process will continue until no more hydrogens are available to be abstracted. However, the reaction always prefers abstraction from a carbon with the least chlorines already attached, because radicals with electron withdrawing groups, like chlorine, are less stable. Also, Statistically, it is more probable that a hydrogen is abstracted from an atom that has more hydrogens available. This means that the reaction must always go to completion, 
and that the maximum amount of chlorine always has to be added. Otherwise, if we stop earlier, we end up with a bunch of partially chlorinated products that are not useful. To tell if the reaction is finished is simple. If the reaction stays yellow from dissolved chlorine, even under irradiation, it means that no more hydrogens are available for abstraction and the reaction is finished, so no analysis is required. I have filmed a good example to show the cleavage of chlorine into chlorine radicals and its immediate reaction followed by release of gaseous hydrogen chloride. When the lamps are turned off, chlorine will simply dissolve into the solution and make it yellow. If I allow that to happen and then later turn on the UV lamps, we can see what happens to the dissolved chlorine. After a short delay, it starts to bubble vigorously from the hydrogen chloride that is produced. And after only a short while, it turns completely clear again as all the chlorine has been consumed. Remaining hydrogen chloride is expelled and it stops bubbling. Since the reaction is relatively fast, chlorine can also be added at a relatively fast rate and none of it escapes, as I could see in the trap because no sulfur was produced. When the reaction is done, I can simply set it up for short path vacuum distillation. It will first expel all the chlorine and hydrogen chloride and then distill over the carbon tetrachloride which can be reused for the same reaction or for another if washed to remove residual chlorine and acid. After that, a non-distilling liquid remains behind which is molten triphosgene. It gradually starts to solidify into a white solid and after a while completely into soft crystals. I also heat it very lightly and pull a direct vacuum just to remove residual solvent that seemed to be there but that can also be done by just vacuum distilling it a bit longer. When that's done, I can just break it up with a spatula and I move it to glass containers. In the end, I decided to just melt it again to pour it in and compact it. Afterward, I am left with 260 grams of triphosgene, which is a yield of 87%. It's a bit lower than literature, but it's because I distilled down the mixture once midway to see for myself if the partial chlorination was true which made me lose a bit of the partially chlorinated products that distilled over into the carbon tet, as I cleaned the carbon tet and then reused it. Either way, it is more than enough triphosgene and the reaction is quite simple and progresses nicely. However, it takes quite a lot of chlorine and it was kinda annoying to replace the generator so many times. In the end, I used about 1.5 kilos of TCCA. Now that I have triphosgene, I can start with the first reaction of the sweetness blocker synthesis. So I again set up a large flask with a stir bar into which I add 11.8 grams of the reagent 4-amino benzonitrile and then dissolve this in 250 mL of dichloromethane. When it has fully dissolved, I add in 10.5 grams of the base sodium bicarbonate. On top of that, I add in 100 mL of water. I then weigh out 10.9 grams of partially molten triphosgene and I dissolve it in 50 mL of dichloromethane and add it all to the mixture giving this biphasic reaction mixture that is a lot softer on the reaction, opposed to just using an organic solvent and an amine base. Amine bases, especially triethylamine, can be disturbing for the reaction because they can react with the phosgene. Pyridine is one of the suitable amine bases. However, in this mixture, both triphosgene and the isocyanate product can react with water, but this reaction is very slow, as they are insoluble in water and the temperature is low. Still, it means the reaction should be ended after 30 minutes, immediately after it is done. Otherwise, the yield will slowly decrease over time. In this reaction, the amine of 4-amino benzonitrile reacts with triphosgene in the presence of a base, giving this isocyanate product. We add the triphosgene quickly to prevent unreacted 4-amino benzonitrile to react with the isocyanate and give a symmetrical urea. In this case, anilines aren't that nucleophilic and phosgene is a lot more electrophilic than an isocyanate, so it shouldn't be fast enough to form significant amounts of this impurity. How it proceeds is first through nucleophilic attack of the amine onto the carbonyl carbon of triphosgene. A pair of bond electrons from the carbonyl double bond is then forced onto the oxygen. The protonated amine in the intermediate is quickly deprotonated by the bicarbonate ion, which then splits apart into CO2 and water. The electron pair then returns to form a carbonyl double bond, but kicks off the trichloro part instead, as it is a much better leaving group. That part also kicks off one chlorine, which is also a good leaving group, causing the formation of phosgene and sodium chloride. Phosgene will continue to react with another 4-amino benzonitrile molecule, in a way analogous to the initial reaction. We then have this carbamate intermediate, 
which also contains this great leaving group and so is more easily deprotonated by the bicarbonate ion. These bond electrons move to form a nitrogen carbon double bond and kicks off phosgene, again giving CO2, water, sodium chloride and the final isocyanate product. After a short while, it has become transparent again. I managed to lose some footage here, so bear with me. I just took the bottom dichloromethane layer and distilled off all the solvent, giving a slightly yellow solid that should be the isocyanate product. I just immediately continue with the next reaction, since weighing it should give something nearly quantitative anyway, as there is no real purification. Some reports subliming them, but that is a bit time consuming. So for the next reaction, I add in 150 ml of acetonitrile as a solvent, and I let it stir a bit to loosen the solid. To this, I add 8.3 grams of the reagent aminomethane sulfonic acid, which can be bought cheaply online. To that, I add 25 ml of water and 3 grams of sodium hydroxide to dissolve it as its sodium salt. When it has dissolved, I immediately add all of it to the mixture, however, I did make a mistake here by having it quite hot. I had it standing for some days and wrongly assumed it still had DCM in here that I had to evaporate off, which is why I wanted to boil it off and then I found out I had already done that and there was acetonitrile inside. So now it was hot and I was too lazy to wait for it to cool down, in my brain farted embarrassment. That is the result of doing multiple projects through each other. Either way, let's hope that didn't do anything crazy, because it kind of started boiling and, and stuff, so I let it stir strongly for a day. In this reaction, the amine of 4-amino methane sulfonate reacts with the isocyanate to form this urea product. How it proceeds is first through nucleophilic attack of the amine onto the electron deficient carbon of the isocyanate, moving a pair of carbonyl bond electrons onto the oxygen. This amine then deprotonates the other amine, while the carbonyl double bond reforms and a pair of bond electrons from the carbon-nitrogen double bond moves onto the nitrogen, giving this final urea product. When I return, a lot of solid has precipitated and I let it stir stronger for the remainder. After that, a lot has splashed on the walls and it should be finished. I then filter out all of the precipitated material that should contain the product. I wash it with acetonitrile and I discard the filtrate. I take the residue and I put it in a beaker. I now slurry it with 50 ml of water and heat it to 90 C to dissolve the product and leave behind insoluble side products. When that's done, I filter it again and impurities should stay on the filter while the product dissolves in the water. It looks like around half of it was the impurity. Perhaps that is a result of the high temperature from the reaction. Some material already crystallizes from the solution, but I first move it to a crystallizing dish to concentrate it down. It changes colors to orange and I concentrated it further in this beaker. I then set it aside to allow it to cool down to room temperature. And when that's done, some solid has crystallized out. I collect it with vacuum filtration and wash it once with some water. Only a little bit is on the filter and I move it all to this tiny dish. After heating it on the hot plate for a second to dry it, it became a powder and the weight is about 1 gram of what should be the final product, so definitely some losses have been incurred. Anyhow, it's enough to try a little experiment to see if it works. So I set up a glass of water into which I add some of the artificial sweetener sodium cyclamate. After dissolving it, I taste it to make sure it has perceivable sweetness, and yes, it is mildly sweet. I then wait for the taste to pass and rinse my mouth. I take some of the sweetness blocker and just put some directly on my tongue and mix it around. The taste is very slightly salty, but nothing more. I then take another sip, and honestly it did reduce the sweetness, but it also made the bitter off taste of this sweetener a lot more pronounced. Perhaps because it is now more balanced towards bitterness, with part of the sweetness not functioning. In the literature, they mention it blocks about 50% of the sweetness and also 50% of the bitterness of some compounds like caffeine. It's a funny compound and there exists more sweetness antagonists, but I haven't seen one that can block 100%. If it exists, let me know and I will make a challenge between sweetest compound and full sweetness blocker. That was it, see ya.